Welcome City Bible Church at Home. We are in a series I'm entitling When You Need a Miracle. So if you get your Bibles and join me in Mark chapter 6, let me just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we invite you now into our presence, Lord. You see that where two or three are gathered in your name, there are you right in the midst. And even though we're doing this virtually, Lord, you are well able to be with each one of us each in, in each and every situation, wherever we are, because you're omnipresent, you're omnipotent, and you're omniscient. And we thank you that we can come to a God in full assurance of faith that you are well able to meet us in whatever situation we are in with a miracle. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us apply this to our lives this day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, it was the height of World War II when the USS Mason was commissioned out of the Boston shipyards. Its job was to escort um, ships back and forth across the Atlantic from Europe to the Americas. But the interesting thing about the USS Mason was that it had an all African American crew. I mean, that was it was amazing. But there was also an amazing thing that happened. It was in the fall of 1944, and they found themselves escorting ships from the States over to England, and it encountered what was called the greatest storm of a hundred years. They were able to radio back to the ships that were in, in the convoy behind them to tell them to turn back, but they themselves were already far um, into the storm and too far that they couldn't turn back. And um, so they pressed on. It was an unbelievable storm. It tossed that ship back and forth. That North Atlantic was just just throwing waves after wave after wave at it. And the USS Mason hit a wave that was so vicious, it literally cracked the steel hull of that ship. Well, they thought the ship was going to sink. But that all African-American crew pulled together in, a, in an unbelievable miracle itself. They were able to literally hold that ship together until they could get it into port in England. Now, I don't know if the storm was like that or not, but it was a vicious storm that you read about in Mark chapter 6. Now, if you remember last time we looked at the feeding of the 5,000, well, I don't know about you, but but when you need a miracle, you need to be able to know for a fact that there's one that can be available to you. What do you do when you need a miracle? Well, I don't know anything other than, you know, just to, to cry out to God and say, God, here it is. Here it is. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for you. I'll wait on you. I'll wait for you to move in it. And maybe that's where you are, folks. Maybe that's exactly where you are in your life right now. Maybe you need a miracle in, in your marriage. Maybe you need a miracle in your health, in your finances, in your family. I, I don't know what it is, but maybe you need a miracle. You need to understand this passage of Scripture because the disciples had just come away from an unbelievable miracle where this multitude of thousands was fed. This miracle left such an impression on them that each one of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all wrote about it. Each one of them recorded it. It's the only miracle that shows up in all four of the Gospels. Now, you know, we, we, as we go through this in, in the next part of, of uh, Mark chapter 6, we come to another situation where they need God to move. And we're going to see another incredible miracle take place. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background as we look at this. And I really need to break this passage down into two messages because there's just too much here. So we're going to do the first half this week and we'll, we'll finish it up next time. But the first thing I want us to see today is that the, the, there are 
things taking place on the shore and there are things taking place on the sea. And on the shore we see that that Jesus has just fed the 5,000. But do you ever wonder why 5,000? Bible is very specific. It says 5,000 men. And then when you add women and children, there could have been 15,000 people in that multitude. But it talks about 5,000 men. Why? Think about it. It says they were 5,000 men a Roman legion was 5,200. Now just keep that in the back of your mind because that 5,000 men is practically a Roman legion. And the Jews had longed for a military Messiah. In fact, the rabbis had taught that, that when the Messiah come, he was going to come and throw off any foreign government that had, had impressed themselves on uh, the nation of Israel, they had taught that this military Messiah was going to restore Israel back to its glory days, back to when David was king and Solomon was king. And, and this nation, this nation of Rome um, would be cast off and Israel would become a leading world empire again. And so this massive multitude is following Jesus, and it's like an army. Now, how does an army move? It moves on its stomach. And if you have your Bibles there, you need to know the reason that God gave us these fingers was so you could put it in Mark chapter 6 and turn back and look at John chapter 6, because John lays this out so well. Um, he captures the concept of what we're talking about in verse 15. And he says in chapter 6 and verse 15, he says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, in the Greek, that word force literally means violence. And they were going to literally take him and make him be the Messiah they wanted him to be. Now, go back to Mark chapter 6 and look at verse 45. It says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. Now, notice he doesn't let the disciples send them away. He does it. Why is that? This is a, an army in the making here. This is an army that can, can happen on, at the drop of a hat. I mean, they knew that he could do it. He could lead them. If Jesus would lead them, he could, well, they knew he could feed them. And and if, you know, if he could feed them like he did, he's obviously all powerful. He's omnipotent. He could lead them. And so that's what's taking place on the shore. Just keep that in your mind. And, and we're going to fast forward a little bit and look out to what's taking place on the sea. Now, the Sea of Galilee has always been a volatile body of water. It could, it could blow up in a, in a heartbeat. Very small um, body of water. It's only about six or seven miles across. It's about 14 or 15 miles long. And it's, it's in a bowl. It's like somebody scooped out the dirt and put the dirt all around the body of water. And it's about 600 feet below sea level. And, and when the wind blows over those, those hills, those, those mountains, they call them, um, but when the wind blows over, it just creates this turmoil in that body of water. <clears throat> and so Jesus sends them out on the, to the sea to go to Bethsaida. But the question is, did Jesus know when he sent them out that there's going to be a storm? Well, of course he did. He's omniscient. God knows everything. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen when he sent them out onto that, that sea. But, but that's just a little bit of a, a, a dilemma for us, isn't it? 
it's a dilemma for us because you know we we you know we we question God God why would you ever put them out on the sea why would you do that to them why would you put them in a boat in a storm but before I get to that I want to tell you three things about storms I want to break those three things down to three things each first of all the nature of storms you need to know first of all that storms are inevitable I've said before if you're not in one right now watch there's one coming down the road you may have just come out of one you may not be in one right now but I can assure you there's one that's going to come and the reality is we don't just have one storm in our life. We're going to sail through a multitude of storms. That's what James talks about over in James chapter 1. But not only are these storms inevitable, they're unpredictable. You never know when they're going to happen. It'd be nice if we could say, oh, storm coming next Tuesday. I'm going to shut down for the day, stay home, lock myself in my study, and, and pray the day away. But we don't know, do we? They are unpredictable. They're inevitable and they're unpredictable. Now, I know I'm getting old and I know that because I watch the news for the weather report. You know, some people, my brother does. He turns on the weather station. He leaves it running on his, his team. No sound or anything, just the, the weather um, all day long. He, he doesn't really watch it. It's just running. Some people run to their horoscope. Some people go to psychic advisors. They want to know if there's a storm coming down the pipe. Well, can I just save you from all of that and give you the answer? The answer is yes. Yes, there's one coming. You are going to encounter storms in your life because they are inevitable. They are unpredictable. But the third thing is they are indiscriminate. They don't discriminate. It doesn't matter whether you're young or you're old or you're rich or you're poor. They're going to come. You can be educated, uneducated, male or female. There's going to be a storm in your life at some point in time. And it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, up in social standing or down in social standing. They are indiscriminate. They are inevitable, they are unpredictable, and they are indiscriminate. And that's the nature of storms. But let me tell you about the kinds of storms. There are various kinds of storms. And the first thing is that there are situational storms. And you find yourself in a situational storm. That's what Solomon was saying back in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 27. Listen to this. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. You see, Sometimes you just find yourself in a storm and, and you, you find that it's situational. You find yourself that uh, maybe in the wrong place at the wrong time and, and it just blows up. It's situational. But the second thing is that it could be relational. Relational. It could be uh, in a marriage or a family situation or a friendship. Whatever the case is, it could be financial, could be medical. But storms happen and, and they can be relational. And then the third thing is that they can be emotional. There are emotional storms that we can experience and we can hide from that pretty well as Christians, can't we? I mean, we can make people think that everything is pretty good on the outside. We're pretty spiritual. We got this, you know, God is, is, is good. He, he's working in my life. And we look good on the outside but on the inside, there's a storm that's raging. You ever watched a duck on the water? How they just so, so, so smoothly glide across the water? It looks just so effortless. But underneath those little feet are going 100 miles an hour to propel them. And we come to church and we want everybody to think that we're spiritual, that we don't have any problems, that we're calm on the outside. But on the inside, we're just frantic. But now, let me tell you about the, 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 the um, 
places storms come from, where they originate. We've talked about the nature of storms. We've, talking about, we've talked about the kinds of storms. Let me tell you about where they come from. And uh, the first thing is you need to know that they come from the enemy of our souls. They come from Satan himself. Remember back in Job chapter 1, and, and you know the story. I don't need to take the time to go there, but out of the clear blue of the western sky, lightning falls from heaven, and it literally wipes out everything that Job has. Everything. He lost everything. Satan caused that. Listen, folks, there is a devil. There is a real devil. He is active. He's at work, and he has power. But he's on a very short leash. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The first place that storms can originate is from Satan himself. You know, the second place is, is stubbornness. Stubbornness. Back in Acts chapter 27. And you can read it after I'm done. And, and that'll be your homework today. But in Acts chapter 27... Paul is on a ship and he's on his way from Caesarea back to, to Rome because he wants to go before Caesar and plead his case. He wants to appeal to Caesar. But because of the stubbornness of the ship's captain, they end up shipwrecked. Acts chapter 27. And we are all guilty. All guilty. Some of the storms we end up in is because of our stubbornness. And then the third thing is that storms can happen because of sin or self-will. Sin and self-will. Now, remember a guy by the name of Jonah? He, he was in a storm because he had sinned against God. And in this rebellious self-will, he wasn't going to do what God had called him to do. Well, Jonah ended up confessing and and um, he confessed that he was running from God. And the principle is, is that our sin, the sin that we find ourselves in, our rebellious self-will can affect other people as well. It affected not only Jonah, it affected all kinds of people on that boat. And he was in the storm that he was in because of sin in his life. And that's what causes storms. That's where they originate. But it leads me back to this issue. Did Jesus know when he put those disciples onto the boat that these guys are going to end up in, in this storm, that there was a storm coming up? Go back to Mark chapter 6, because I want you to see, folks, God has a plan. God has a purpose for each and every storm that you sail through. God doesn't put you in all of the storms. Don't think that. Don't think that God causes all of the storms in our life. But I'll tell you what, you're going to have a real hard time dealing with this passage and understanding the sovereignty of God when you come to this if if you don't believe that that God knew. Because Jesus made these guys get into the boat. He put them into the storm. Now, I want to overemphasize this. In verse 45, it says immediately. It says immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. Now, the commentators said that uh, say that Jesus got very firm with this. There was there was an urgency to it. Now, for some reason, they didn't want to go. And and we'll look at that as in, in a second, but he made them get into the boat. He says, guys, I got the multitude. I'll look after them. I'll send them away. But right now, I need for you to get into that boat. Right now. You see, there's an urgency to it, and that's important. And I draw your attention to it, but now let me go to verse 46, and I'll come back to that. And in verse 46, it says, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now, you know, 
we find ourselves in these storms from time to time and and we think that you know we're doing what the lord wanted us to do we're we're do we're, we, you know we're in the lord's will here we're doing what he called us to do why would he ever put us into the storm anybody testify amen i can i can god i'm a preacher i'm a preacher i need my voice why would he ever allow that? But here's the thing. It says he put them in the storm and then departed. He put them, he sent them away, and then he departed. Now, if there is one thing the enemy of our soul wants to convince us of is that when you are in a storm, when you're down and devastated, when, when you're just at the bottom, he wants to convince us that God doesn't care. God does he's not here, he's gone. He's departed. Remember, Satan wants you to believe that God is not with you, that he's departed, that he's left you. Now, just for fun, go with me back to Mark chapter four for a minute. Mark chapter four, and let's pick it up beginning in verse thirty-five. It says, On that same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said, said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? I mean, they had to have been thinking that that you know, they're out in the Sea of Galilee, the storm, and we're going to perish. Lord, don't you care? They had to be thinking that. And, and I'm thinking that these guys are struggling. They're out in this sea now in this storm, and, and they're thinking, God, you sent us here. Don't you care? And they're frantic. They're frantic. Now, let me give you a little bit of timeline here, because in uh, chapter 6, they're out in this boat, and the best speculation is that it's about 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. And Jesus comes in the fourth watch. That's between 3 and 6 in the morning. And so for maybe six hours, these guys have been out there rowing and toiling in the storm. Now, John tells us that they've only gone three or four miles. <coughs> and... So that's like maybe a half a mile an hour, you know, something like that. And it means that it's going to take another six hours for them to get to the other side. They, they had to have been exhausted. They're worn out, but they're seasoned fishermen. They're experienced fishermen. They're not rookies who, who've never been in a boat before, never been in a storm before. They knew what they were doing, and yet they're out in this storm, and they need a miracle. And they had to have thought about this situation because they'd been in it before. And they begin to, to, to wonder, you know, why are we out here? Jesus, where are you? Jesus, don't you care? God, where are you? Why does the Lord allow us to go through storms, Christian? Why does the Lord allow us to go through storms? Let me give you two things very quickly. First of all, the Lord allows us to sail through storms for the purpose of correction and prevention. Correction and prevention. God allows us to sail through stormy seas for the purpose of correction and prevention. Now, I've made a big deal about this because I think it's important. Here is this multitude nearly a Roman legion. And they're getting ready to, to seize Jesus and make him this military Messiah. And I wonder if if maybe these disciples hadn't been all caught up in that. You know, may, maybe they're beginning to think, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, this this seems right. This this sounds good. I like the feel of this. I I, I, I like the way this is going. But Jesus forced them to get into the boat. Now listen to me, folks. Listen to this. 
I believe he forced them to get into the boat because that storm at sea was one that they could navigate through ultimately as seasoned, experienced fishermen. But the storm that was on the shore may have cost them everything, everything. It could be that, that God has put you in a storm because he wants to save you from another storm that would have devastated you. You know, we, we don't understand it. it. It doesn't make sense to us. You know, why is all this happening to me? God, where are you? Sometimes we get bitter. We get angry and upset with God. And, and you know, we, we, we have to sail through this storm. And, and we wonder, God, why? Where are you? Well, it could be that, that it's a storm of correction. It could be that it's a storm of prevention and it's saving us from something far worse than what we could be in a different situation. And then it becomes a storm of deliverance, doesn't it? Maybe something we wanted other than what we got would have been, you know, detrimental, would have taken us further out of God's will. And, and so he allows us to go through a different storm, another storm, so that he knows that we can navigate through that. He can navigate us through that. You see, there's storms for correction and there's storms for prevention. But the second thing is that God allows us to go through stormy seas because they're storms of perfection. Storms of perfection. You know, we don't talk too much about perfection, but you know, what I'm talking about is maturing, sanctification, that process of being conformed to his image, becoming Christ-like. And God is trying to grow these disciples, and it's a storm of perfection. He's trying to teach them, trying to train them to be more like himself. Now, what in the world can God teach us out of the middle of a storm? Well, I'm glad you asked. Just close your Bibles. Sit back, close your eyes and listen to this for a minute. And I'm going to end with this. We'll pick it up again next week. But, but I want you to think about this. The first time Jesus is in the boat, he's with Peter. And in Luke chapter 5, he gets into Peter's boat. And, and Peter's been out fishing all night. He's fished all night. And he hasn't got a thing. He hasn't. I've been there. I've been, not all night, but I've been out fishing many times and didn't catch a thing. Can you imagine an experienced professional fisherman fishing all night? Not a thing. Not a thing. And um, there's not only Peter, but there's all these professional fishermen with him. And they haven't caught a thing. And Jesus gets into his boat and he uses Peter's boat as a pulpit, and he speaks to all the people that are there. And I could just see Peter, he's sitting there, he's fumbling with his nets, maybe mending them or something, And but he's listening. He's listening, and Jesus finishes teaching. And he tells Peter, he says, Peter, launch out into the deep. And I can just see Peter, that, you know, the character that he is, you know, and the character traits that he exhibits all the way through scripture. He's thinking, are you kidding me? You're just a preacher, number one. Secondly, you don't know anything. And number three, I'm a professional fisherman. I've been doing this all my life. But he doesn't want to hurt the preacher's feelings. And so he just does what he says. And so they launch out into the deep, and you know the story. They got a boatload of fish. Peter comes and he falls on his knees before God, before the Lord, and he says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. But what is Jesus teaching Peter in this situation? Check it out. Check it out. Jesus is saying that when I am in the boat on a clear day, on a calm sea, and I'm in the boat, you can trust me. You can trust me. During the day on a calm sea, when I'm in the boat, you can trust me. And now they've learned. They've learned 
they come now at night and, and it's a stormy sea. And Jesus is teaching them that at night on a stormy sea and I'm in the boat, you can trust me. In 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 uh, Mark chapter four, when he's asleep in the boat, and and they get him out up, and he calms the wind and the waves. He says, "Guys, don't you have any faith? Because on that stormy sea, and I'm in the boat, you can trust me. During the day on the sea, when I'm in the boat, you can trust me. At night, when the sea is raging and I'm in the boat, you can trust me. But now, here we get to Mark chapter six. And they're out there on the sea and they're in the boat by themselves. What on earth is Jesus trying to teach them now? He's gone. He's not there. Jesus, where are you? I'm in this situation. I don't seem to be getting an answer from heaven. Listen, what God is trying to teach them is this. At night, on a stormy sea, when he's not in the boat, you can still trust him. Can I give you those again? Because this is so, so vital to each one of us. On a clear day, on a calm sea, and Jesus is with us. We're walking with him. We can trust him. At night on a stormy sea, and, and he's with us. We're walking with him. We know we can trust him. But when we are in the storm of the century, and it's just raging out there, and he's not in the boat, we can still, still trust him. I don't know where you are, but I do know that you need to know that. Again, you need to have that tucked up under your arm to face the rest of today, the rest of the week, and the rest of your life. Let me close in prayer. And Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, how it speaks to our very soul. Lord, we thank you for allowing us the privilege through the shed blood of Jesus Christ to come to you, that because we've come to him, confessed our sin, we've repented, turned from our sin, and turned to him and made him Lord. You've saved us from the raging storm of life and promised us eternal life. And so, Father, we're so mindful for that. Thank you, Father, that one day there won't be any storms, but we're thankful that even this side of glory, when the storms come, you're right there with us all the way. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, folks. Lord bless each and every one of you.